Everyone wants to take their business, their skills, to the next level. Small and mid-sized business owners have exceptional insight into how to do this. They endure and thrive because they find ways to overcome the challenges that come their way, and they can teach us valuable lessons to apply to our own companies and lives. Stephen Nooner, founder and owner of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. And Bob Gibbons, builder of Riata Commercial Realty, a real estate advisor and tenant advocate, are two prominent Metroplex businessmen who, along with their weekly guests, will ask their and your probing questions, finding impactful solutions that will help you reach for the next level. Here are your hosts, Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Welcome to the Next Level, conversations that propel business. I'm Stephen Nooner. And I'm Bob Gibbons today. Most days today. I am. <laughs> <laughs> it varies. Glad your alter ego didn't show up. Hey, today Sweet we... the leg, Johnny. That's... Oh, no. Not the karate kid. This is an ongoing joke you yeah. just don't want to know about. <laughs> hey, today we got Zane Conkle with Citricom as our guest today. And Citricom is a uh, nine-year-old company, about 28 employees, and they're based up in Allen. And uh, But they do business all over the country. And they're a voice-over internet phone service company and uh what's cool about this we'll, we'll get into this more is that zane has owned this company for nine years and he started when he was like 18 years old and it's not his first company unbelievable so we got a lot to talk about today so uh welcome zane we're lo looking forward to yeah, talking to thank you y'all for having me i appreciate it yeah glad to have you here um before we get started, um, can you explain to Bob what the internet is? <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. What's that WW thing going on? <laughs> um, no, we like to start off with the wisdom of others. And uh, your grandfather, I thought, had an interesting quote. It only costs, yeah. and it's appropriate being all the United Airlines stuff lately, it only costs a few dollars more to go first class. What does that mean to you and why did he say it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is something that I've heard for years, me and my grandfather are pretty close. And we, uh, actually my first business, I started when I was 15 years old. My first official business, I guess, is incorporated and recognized by the state. Uh, <laughs> had several others when I was younger, I guess, but first business I started, when I was 15 with him. And so we've been close. I always tell people he taught me business and I taught him computers. <laughs> and so, so throughout the years, I've heard him say it only costs a few dollars more to go first class. And the funny thing is if I think back, he, he's definitely a person that you uh, you practice what he preaches and don't look and see what he does because, you know, I could tell 100, 100 stories of um, where he hasn't lived that out. But uh, I, I see it come true more and more even, even today. You know, if you cut corners, if you – whether it's in advertising, uh, consulting, it doesn't matter. If you, if you cut corners and you don't do it right, it, pay, it, you know, it, it costs you. So it just pays to do it right the first time. If you can't afford to do it right the first time, then maybe you don't do it at all, and you look for another method, and you figure out what you can do. Um, but we can get into some stories, and I think it'll. I think the statement will bear itself out through this. Well, through this interview. Well, I uh, I learned that lesson the hard way. We I started our company have the guest bedroom in our home, completely bootstrapped it. You know, we're about twenty people now. Mm -hmm. um, very on. I, I I did that all the time, and then I read. Um, this book and actually saw this sign that I, I that went along with the book that I've framed and hung in my office and they talk about scarcity versus abundance mindset and one of the things to talk about is actually in your language cost versus investment mm -hmm. they're both really kind of represent the same thing mm -hmm. but when you look at everything as a cost it's something to be minimized I got to minimize my experience right. everything else but when you look at it from an investment it's like I want to maximize ROI so a few bucks more if I get a tenfold return, yeah. is okay. But you're still talking about well, being I, efficient, you know? Yeah, and I think what's interesting, and you, you see this as you scale up, if if you're not careful, you can you can maintain the same mentality you had early starting, you know, when you first started, where you're just looking at the dollars. I've I've got an uncle that's very successful. I tell him all the time, you know, he he obsesses sometimes about he's he's looking to move his office, uh -huh. and he needs about sixty thousand square feet or so. He's like, man, I just can't bring myself to to pay these high rental rates. I'm like, man, I don't even want to hear it from you. You're looking, you're looking at one side of the equation. You're looking at the expense side. Look at, look at what your business has done over the last five or six years. And so, 
you know, it's, I think it's a very applicable statement. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into the, the company. And by the way, uh, for our listeners, you can go to uh, the internet, Stephen, and look up Citracom.com to get more information about uh, Zane's company. It's C-Y-T-R-A-C-O-M.com. So tell us, how did you get into the, into the business that you're in now? You mentioned another company before when you were 15. Did one lead into the other? Yeah, it really did. I kind of fell into this business, honestly. Um, you know, I, my first business was a computer repair business. And my grandfather owned several buildings in my hometown. We grew up in Wiley, mm-hmm. um, east of here. And, you know, we repaired computers. We had a storefront. People would bring their computers in. We'd fix them. We'd sell new computers. And that kind of evolved into uh, doing managed services and uh, IT for businesses, small businesses in the local area. There wasn't really anybody out in that part of town that uh-huh. did that. Um so through the course of doing that, you know, we had a phone system at our office. The business was growing. We had a we had an old phone system, and we were constantly having problems with it. And so I upgraded the system to an IP-based system. It wasn't hosted, a solution like we do that's in the cloud or internet-based. But I, I basically replaced our phone system. And through the course of doing this, I met somebody um, at a trade show that, that does what we do now, or, or at the early stages of what we do now. And I thought, man, this is a, a cool concept. And this is the way that things are going. So I, um, you know, I, I, we started Citricon basically and made this uh, made this happen. It's been nine years, and it's been this industry has really taken off over the nine years. Early on, there were uh, there were bumps in the road and issues with it. It was new technology, um, but we've seen it really become main place now. So when you saw that technology, you said, "I got to get into that," and so you sold the computer repair company and started this. Yep. So, so I started this, and yeah, very, very shortly thereafter, we we sold the computer company. Just the demand uh, for time, and I and I could just see the potential, you know. Whereas my computer company was, uh, I was very geographically bound. You know, I could only work within a certain distance. Now we've got you know thousands of customers all over the, in forty eight states across the country. So just a easier business to scale. Yeah, a lot easier business to scale. Um, the demand was there, and it's not. You know, something that, that I've realized pretty early on is this business is not labor intensive. So I don't need a, you know, a huge head count or a, a big labor force. Sure. It's software. It's on the cloud. And so, whereas my other business was very labor intensive. Um, so so that, what was it about this business, though? I mean, I, the fact that you already had a little bit of experience with voice over internet, mm-hmm. but was it the fact that this was a hosted through the internet kind of model? Is that what got you so excited? Yeah, I think so. Just seeing, you know, the way it was delivered uh, and what, just the potential really, I think more than anything, seeing that, uh, you know, there was really no limit to what could be done uh, with with this uh, technology. So when you saw this technology from this trade show, and did you implement it in your own company first and try it for a while? We did. So I was actually at the trade show, and, and the guy that I ran into, there was no vendor there actually pushing this. It was some guy that I actually <laughs> sat down at a table with at lunch, and we started talking. Wow. And I'm like, man, I'm actually replacing my phone system now. And so we this we got this dialogue going. and um, But I did. I put it in our office. And it was actually – it was kind of rocky even when we put it in our in our office at the time but i could i could see the potential i could see that you know if we can get the kinks worked out of this this will be this will be an amazing thing and we're seeing that i mean if you look now the the numbers are just staggering of you know the people that are moving to this technology um every, everything's going this way and the capabilities are being because of the software piece are being developed exponentially i mean we've been long time uh we started with like vonage when it was ah, 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 ah. Yep, sorry yep. vonage but it used to be it was terrible and now we have a, a different similar type of service to what you offer and it, i've been blown away at the exponential features that have been created the improvement of qualcomm i mean the technology is just yeah. advanced so rapidly where forever it was like oh sweet i got like the old landlines like oh i got caller id now mm-hmm. yeah i started you know? with rank central <laughs> before i upgraded a little bit so yeah i'm okay. i'm a fan of that as well so how do you go from hey this looks cool to actually becoming a you know yeah having the company that provides the service i mean did you just go buy some you know this guy's technology or what well so what we started doing early on is we basically licensed the technology from the guy uh to to provide this service Mm -hmm. and 
what we found out pretty quickly is that there were holes in the in the software and you know i talk about some of the rough rough uh, edges and things places where we had issues um, so we found out pretty quickly that if we were going to make this work that we had to develop our own platform and we've been doing this long enough that we we brought engineering in-house and we wrote our own software and we've got our own data centers you know that we run all this out of um, and that's really something that's pretty unique to us in this space because most people do lease software. And now there are companies, you mentioned Ring Central, you know, there are companies that um, the majority of the, of the players in this game, they lease uh, a big brand name switch or whatever to make the, to make the calls happen. But we were we were just fortunate and just by happen chance, we decided, okay, we're going to um, – we're going to build our own software, and we did. And it's given us the flexibility to do what you're talking about, add all these features and this functionality, sure. custom integrations. And, you know, it's interesting that you talk about Ring Central because, and you talk about being back on Vonage because this solution really is for any any small business owner, and it's a no-brainer because if you look traditionally, I think going back to your other question, that's something that, that made a lot of sense to me too at the time getting into this business. I looked and I said, okay, I've got this old phone system on the wall. This thing... People spend tens of thousands of dollars Super buying. Expensive. Yeah, yeah. So people spend tens of thousands of tens of thousands of dollars on a phone system for their business, and the thing turns into what I have hanging on the wall—a nightmare. You know, something that you have to deal with, maintain, hire help, programmers, hard, hard to get upgraded. Yeah. Versus a solution like we offer today, where there's, you know, there's no capex, there's no cost up front. It's a simple subscription service, and so I, I think that's something else that really stood out to me is, you know, if we can. If we can perfect this, it, it will become a no-brainer, and it, I believe it truly has. Did, did you have revenue when you decided to bring it back in-house? I mean, did you have revenue to support that already, or was it like we're just – I mean, did you have to deploy capital from your personal to, to, to do that? Because that's not yeah, so, inexpensive. Uh, yeah, so a lot of it, um, we did have revenue, and then uh, we deployed a little bit of capital. Um, but we've, we've never used outside capital or uh, had any uh, external equity. Uh, so we bootstrapped the thing early on, That's and awesome. um, I think you know we we had enough revenue to support it, and we realized that okay, this was really important that we do this. Um, so we just threw everything we had at it, and really probably for the first, you know, for the first eighteen months or so, twenty four months, we really focused on engineering and the software. And there's been several iterations of it through through the course of our life. Uh, lifetime as a company, but we we st- st- took a step back and go back to my earlier statement. You know, we weren't going to do anything halfway. So we we really cut marketing where we weren't doing any marketing. We were really in just main uh, you know maintenance mode. We didn't want to lose any customers. We would take new people on, but we weren't out just driving hard. We wanted to create a good solid foundation. So, so. you use this guy's software that you licensed for how long before you had your own ready to go and up and running? Um, I'm trying to think back, you know, I think probably the first two years, you know, cause we had made a transition sure. and we had some people, people on it. Um, but like I said, you know, it, it would work for some customers, but depending on people's requirements, it didn't work well. So it was, um, it was an adventure. I guess it would be. I mean, that's a big daunting task to all of a sudden say, I'm going to stop licensing somebody's stuff and, and do my own, create my own. I mean, that's it's sort of like starting a company, going two years and starting another company. Yeah, yeah in a way. That's, that's true. Well, we're going to go to a break. Uh, when we get back, thousands of clients in 48 states with no sales force. Stick around. And now, Confessions of a Recovering Landlord. This is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty, and I am your recovering landlord. After 20 years as a landlord, I now use that experience only for the benefit of companies that lease or buy office buildings and warehouses. Today's confession, knowledge is power. We all negotiate from a position of power and strength, or at least we want to. In any negotiation, the party with the most knowledge probably has the upper hand. And landlords count on this being the case whenever uh, you're negotiating a lease, because most landlords are professional real estate investors and they hire professional leasing agents and property managers. Landlords are in the market every day negotiating leases, while tenants probably only negotiate one, maybe two leases every few years. So tenants feel outgunned. Don't let landlords have all the power. As a former landlord for 20 years, I understand how landlords think and what motivates them. So let me put that knowledge and experience to work on your side of the negotiation. To learn more, contact me at texastenantrep.com. Again, that's texastenantrep.com. 
Have you started making plans to take your business to the next level in 2016? Hi, I'm Steven Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali. We have a trademark process called the Empowered Advantage that enables CEOs, business owners, and entrepreneurs to more effectively buy and manage their insurance. Before sitting down to make your plans for the new year, here are just a few things to consider. Would you say that you have an actual insurance strategy, one that you can articulate, or have you just purchased a policy here and there over the years? If you have an insurance strategy, was it discussed under the pressure of a renewal deadline or considered earlier in the year to avoid fire drill decision making? If your answer was no to either of these questions, then you may not have the right partner on your team. Visit AlkaliServices.com to contact us and take the next step to a bigger and better future. Hi, I'm Carissa Richardson with Benjamin Franklin Plumbing and Lawton Commercial Services. I'm appearing on a show with Stephen and Bob to keep their show from going down the drain. <laughs> Welcome back to The Next Level. We're here with our special guest, Zane Conkle. If you want to learn more about his company, Citracom, please visit citracom.com. That's C-Y-T-R-A-com.com. A lot of comms going on yes. there. Yeah. It's, that's, <laughs> Comic-Con that's been, was it's just been here. Confused. So. It's been confusing. Yeah. All right. So you, you sell your other company. You get into the voiceover internet business. You're licensing somebody else's uh, software, and then you start building your own. I mean, did all that fit into your business plan? How did you... I mean, did you change your plan as you went, or how did that go? Yeah, so I think the interesting thing that I tell people is, and people kind of look at me astonished, is I never had a formal business plan when I started this business. Meaning I, nothing I, in writing? Not a single page, <laughs> not, <laughs> nor, nor my other business. And I tell people, I can't tell you how many people come to me, uh, you know, people that I know, friends, hey, I'm trying to start this business, and, and they want they want in, input, or they've got this long deck of all these these thought processes and how they're going to make it work. And I just kind of shake my head because I see, I can't tell you how many times I see people just over and over, just wear themselves out. Yeah. Uh, just so much effort spent on this complex business plan. And there are just too many variables and too many unknowns. I mean, we, you need to know which direction you're headed, you know, you're going up, down, but once you start moving, you know, conditions change, market, you know, markets change, uh, you start to understand your customer better. You can start making course corrections. At first, it may be 20 or 30 degrees, um, you know, but then it, is it st you start getting dialed in. You're, you're moving left or right five degrees, three degrees. And so trying to trying to establish all that on the front end when you really don't have a good understanding of your customer, you think you do, um, the other players in the market, I think is just kind of silly. Now, if I had a big MBA, if I would have gone to school, you know, I may, I may, may think something different, but... I've just never, I just haven't seen that work out well. And, and the friends that I have and the people that have come to me, I see them wear themselves out constantly on these business plans and they never get anything going. They never start. They never start. And I was like, take that effort. They talk themselves out of it with their business plan. <laughs> they do. Take the effort and go, go try and see if it sticks, see if you can make it work. And then you can start, you know, I, I try to, I'm real big on agile. I don't know if you know what agile is, yeah. but, but we very much throughout our organization, we, we don't look at, we have big goals, you know for several years out, but we really, things move so quick that we're looking, you know, two weeks to 30 days. And, and we're just constantly, um, re, you know, iterating over our processes and what we're doing. We've got a very short uh, window that we look through. Hmm. Uh, that is short. Instead of this, you know, way out, what are we going to do over five, 10 years? I don't know what five or 10 years look like. Sure. I, I, I really don't. So why waste the energy on it? So did you, you started this at 18. Did you bother with college? Uh, no, I actually... Uh, graduated high school a year early so I could do this. Uh, so I went, it, it's funny, I, because uh, I had my first business, you know, at 15, so I'm in, high, I'm in high school. I couldn't drive. My grandfather would come, <laughs> my grandfather would come pick me up in, in this truck we affectionately called Snubby. So go back to, you know, it always costs a few dollars more to go first class. My, my grandfather, it, who is, you know, upper middle class at a minimum, is driving you know, a 1990s Toyota truck that somebody had rear-ended <laughs> into the back of somebody. He gets me out one summer with the come along, pulling the the front of this thing out of the truck, no radiator, and he and he's driving this thing around town. You know that somebody gave him because it really belonged in a junkyard. So we'd pull up at a stoplight. He'd turn turn the engine off because there's no radiator, so the engine would overheat. We'd start it back <laughs> and go. You know, so so he picks me up from school in this truck, and we we go to work. And so I figured out. Um, you know, I needed more time. I can't stand school. Must have been hard to get a date. <laughs> yeah, it is tough. So, 
you know, I got on, I started by getting on the work program at school and where I would basically leave after lunch. I'd do half days. And then, you know, as, as the requirements for my time increased, I figured out, okay, I've got, I've got to do something different. So I ended up going to, um, like an alternate school, an alternative school there that the, that the school district had. And I finished up my whole senior year in like two months or something. Wow and knocked it out and no, no college. Cause I started this when I was 18 and I just wanted to work. Yeah. Why <laughs> I just wanted to make money. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so you mentioned your grandfather. I thought, uh, something I thought was pretty interesting. Most people try to avoid family and friends and business. And, uh, it seems like you've taken the direct opposite path. Yeah. So. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of my, my drive and experience come from family, uh-huh. whether it's my grandfather or, uh, other family members that are entrepreneurial. Uh, but, you know, I started this business with my best friend. We met when we were 10 years old and we met at church and, you know, we immediately hit it off. Our parents mm-hmm. became very close friends and we'd spend, you know, if we weren't at school, we were spending time together and, you know, we'd, we'd stay over at each other's houses through the weekend. And so we, we grew, we really grew up together like, like brothers uh-huh. and, I, uh, he, uh, he actually worked with me in our computer repair business with my grandfather. <laughs> and so we decided to start this and, uh, it's, it's been, it's been great. So we actually, uh, share the CEO role. So with the two in the box strategy and it works out really, really well for, well for us. I don't know that I would do it with anybody else, but we've, we've known each other so long. I mean, I can count literally on one hand. I, I think this is an amazing thing the number of times that that we've walked out of a room disagreeing on something, Hmm. it just doesn't happen. And so we're, we very much have different strengths and we, we really partition the load according to those strengths. One, you said less than one hand, the times you guys have disagreed uh, on things was one of them when uh, you told him you wanted to date his sister. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I don't even think I told him that. And you, you just started like, doing it. I just started doing it. <laughs> and luck, luckily, you know, he's he's very laid back, and uh, he just never had anything to say about it, really. And um, he never had much to say. And now you're married to her. Yep, I am. And just welcome two two boys here. In, in January. Two beautiful boys. Yeah. So you know, it's been it's been great. We, uh, you know, I told her when I was ten I was going to marry her. So when we first met and. I, she made me. She made me work. I had. I had to. It took me a little while, but smart woman. But I, I finally convinced her that I, I had to be the right choice. Wow! That's awesome. Congrats. Well, hey. So, getting back to the the business real quick. How do you guys sell? I mean, you've got thousands of clients over forty eight states. I mean, out of Allen, Texas. I assume you don't have offices in all those other states. So, how do you how do you do that? Yeah. So early on, because of my background in the IT field. And I mentioned earlier when we were talking, I've got an uncle that's got a successful business. He has one of the most successful, uh, if not the most successful, managed services business here in Texas. Hmm. And so we really understand the the IT market. And when I say managed services, I'm talking about companies that that support small businesses, their networks, their servers, uh, you know, their phones, all of that. Uh, so we understand that space. So what we what we decided early on was. Citricom is a technical product. It's voice over IP, and it may be sold as as a simple product. You know, you just plug it into the internet and it works. And there's a lot of truth to that. But what we figured out really early on in the journey is you have non-technical people buying a technical product. Mm. Um, so we decided to go, and I can give and I can give an example of that. You know, you take a. Well, I'll answer your question more directly, I guess. We, with no sales staff, we have over 1,200 resellers or 1,200 distributors across the country that, pu- that push uh, our product. So what they do is these managed service providers, they have relationships with their existing clients, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, doctors, uh, you know, professional service businesses, manufacturing, it doesn't matter. They'll, they'll walk into their clients and say, hey, you've got this old phone system that you've had for years. You're having problems with it. We'd like to upgrade you, and here's the solution. Uh, you know, here's Citricom. They'll lay it out. And again, it's a, a very compelling uh, story uh, and it just makes sense. So these guys will go in and sell sell our solution. They'll install it, support it. Uh, so on all fronts, it's great for us because we we don't have to have the sales staff. It makes the support 
a lot easier for us because these guys are making sure the customer gets set up correctly on the front side, which we think is really important because if you look at a lot of our competitors in this space, um, I'll give you an example. Take a doctor's office. You've got a doctor, and he's non-technical in nature, and he, mm-hmm. he decides, okay, I need a new phone system for my business. Maybe he has 10 phones around his office or around his practice. He goes online, and he finds a, a provider, and he dials the 800 number, and he talks to this guy clear across the country, you know, this, this salesman, and the guy somehow convinces him that their solution is the right solution for them, uh, for the doctor to put in his office. And, you know, the doctor's excited, the company's excited, you know, they get a signed contract, the the phone company puts phones in a box, ships them to the doctor, you know, the doctor gets a gets a package on his front porch with 10 phones. He's like, man, what do I do with this? Yeah. You know, it's not configured. How do I get this hooked up? How do I make this thing ring? Um, so the nice thing about our model and the way that we distribute our product is with these resellers, they're going out and they're sitting down with the client and they're saying, you know, they've got a demo phone. They're saying, this is the way that this thing functions. This is what we can do for you. And when they sell it, they'll get it installed. They'll get it configured. So it's just, it, it just makes a lot of sense. Uh, was that a con i mean so it was just a conscious choice because you just believe that that you wanted it to be configured properly or was there also kind of like hey i can we can expand our footprint a lot quicker this way too uh i think it was i think it's twofold we we knew that we could expand our footprint but there was really no limitation anyways because we could sell it we could have sold this product online just sure. like anybody else sure. and stuck them in a box and shipped them but the problem is we wouldn't be serving the consumer and the customer right because you know they're going to have a bad experience. So let's, right. let's just be honest. They're going to get these phones. They're going to call into support, and they're going to spend hours trying to figure out how to get this going. And so you start off the bat with a bad relationship with the client. We didn't want to do that. So it was, it was a conscious decision. And I think what led us to that decision, again, was our experience in the IT field. We understand that. We So we really crafted this whole business, the whole model uh, around channel only, around partners, around resellers. And it served us, uh, it served us very well. Would you change anything about the way you've grown your business if you had to do it over again? Uh, I mean, I've learned a lot in nine years. I think, you know, I think if I take what I've learned over the nine years, it probably wouldn't have taken us this long. Um, but, you know, that's that's life. Sure. And uh, from a very high level, I don't think so. You know, I think the the distribution model. We truly believe that that this that this product is going to be sold through the channel. Uh, through uh, IT providers. So I think that what we've done at a high level uh, and the decisions we've made from our, developing our own software has been uh, the right choice. Well, Zane, thanks so much for being our guest today. We've really enjoyed Thank it and learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, for our listeners, please go to Citricon.com to learn more. If you want to know more about the show, please go to nextlevelshow.com and please uh, find us on podcasts where you can search the Next Level Show and find us and uh, search our archives. Uh, Check out Courtney Baker with Kids Care Therapy, who was our guest one time. And while she was in the hospital suffering from an embolism, she learned that one of her employees was committing fraud. Go there, listen to it, and see how she dealt with that. See you next week. Have a great week. You have been listening to The Next Level, conversations that propel business with Stephen Nooner and Bob Gibbons. Join us every Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. for more prolific conversations that will take your business to the next level.